we start, let me just clarify how the question and answer session after the talk will work. Um, we're going to ask you to use the chat function to let us know that you have a question and we will call on you. But there's no need to type your question, just say that you have one, that would be fine. Now to chair the session and introduce our speaker, uh, here's Professor Lydia Kisley. Hi everyone, um, thanks for coming to the first colloquium for the semester and um, I'm very happy to introduce uh, Viva Rothman who's joining us from the Department of History here at Case. And to give you some background of uh, what she studied in the past, I had some fun looking at her CV and hearing about degrees I didn't know about or different fellowships and opportunities from a different field of history. Um, so she received her Bachelor of Arts in History and also the Philosophy of Science from Columbia University and then did her PhD at Princeton where she was a uh, received a university fellowship and was a Shelby and she also won the Shelby Colum Davis Prize for History which is a history institute that's at Princeton. Um, she then did two postdocs one at Carthage College in Kenosha Wisconsin which is in the news now and then uh, was a society fellow in liberal arts at the University of Chicago um, and then she came to Case Western in 2018 and in her academic career, she already has published one book and then has another one in con contract and another in progress, which in physics where we have more publications that are in journals, I think it's impressive to already say like, okay, three, three books um, in the works are published already. Um, and also it stood out to me some of the classes that she's taught here at Case um, that included topics that are just like, what is science? Um, or the history of nature and lots of course titles. I'm like, I wish I could sign up and take some of these classes. Um, and I met Aviva um, in a pre-tenure faculty uh, workshop series where uh, we uh, discussed different topics or uh, about our careers and also had to work on uh, like a elevator pitch. And I remember when she gave her elevator pitch, everybody had a lot of questions about her work and was very intrigued. And it's also very interesting to hear about how her work has aspects of science, obviously in history, but also language comes into play. And I think we're into in for a nice presentation. So with that, uh, welcome and we're interested to hear your talk. Thank you so much, Lydia. It's good to see you and it's uh, good to, to virtually see everybody here. Let me just um, here, minimize my speaker window a little. Okay. Um, so I know it, this is a, an unusual format for a lecture and uh, it's a little hard, like I said before, to see my, my little tiny face in the big PowerPoint, but I'll, I'll try to keep the story interesting enough to keep you engaged. Uh, and let's hope the screen share is working. Let me see. Okay, here we go. Um, so the story I want to tell you today starts in March 1610. Um, we're in Prague, uh, where Johannes Kepler, our protagonist, has uh, risen to the position of imperial mathematician to the Emperor Rudolf II. He, you can see him uh, at the bottom of my screen, both his actual portrait and the famous uh, vegetable fruit portrait of him by Archimboldo, who was one of the court painters there. Um, so Kepler, who had started out as a poor scholarship student at the University of Tübingen, has through a series of twists and turns, eventually taken on this illustrious position. He's living in Prague, he's in his house, and he hears a shout from out the door. So he sticks his head out the door, and he sees the carriage of his friend, the diplomat, Bakker von Wackenfels, driving by. Um, Bakker sticks his head out the window and yells to Kepler, have you heard the news from Italy? Um, and this is the first that um, Kepler heard of the fact that the uh, up and coming uh, Italian astronomer, Galileo Galilei, um, had taken the newly invented telescope and pointed it up at the sky and seen something. <laughs> People weren't sure what it was. Four objects that seemed to be going around Jupiter. I can show you, um, here you have Galileo himself. Um, this is the telescope he used. And these are Galileo's notes of what he's seeing um, as he's recording it, right? He's not himself sure at first what it is. They're, they seem to be stars. Uh, they're near Jupiter. They're moving in different ways. Um, Galileo has not yet his results, but news of the results are quickly spreading through Europe. Uh, people call them the new stars of Galileo. Kepler thinks maybe they're moons, Wacker thinks maybe they're suns, um, but everybody in Europe is very curious about what they mean 
um, and also whether they should trust Galileo and trust his telescope, right? This is new, um, they're not sure how to interpret it. Because Kepler himself already has, you know, a, a pretty well-known um, uh, status and reputation, he gets letters from astronomers and friends from all over saying, what do you think? Should I trust these? What does it mean? Um, and just to give you one example, um, he has a, a young friend, uh, Martin Horky, a bohemian living in Bologna studying astronomy, who begins to write him a series of letters asking him for his opinions. I'll show you a couple of them. He first gets a letter, and this is just shortly thereafter, the 31st of March in 1610. Horky says, I've heard the news. It's a wondrous and astounding thing, but whether it's true or false, I do not know. Um, over the next few weeks, Horky continues to write him letters. Next one, he's a little more doubtful. I want to write concerning the four made-up planets of Galileo, right? So he's already framing them as not true. Please finally let me know what you think. That's the 6th of April. By the, 10th, the 16th of April, he writes, I want nothing more than to learn whether you have seen these four planets of Galileo, whether that fable is true. So he explains. Afterwards is that Galileo shows up to the house that Horky is living in Bologna. He's living with the famous Italian astronomer Giovanni Antonio Magini. Um, he brings his telescope with him and he conducts a demonstration for them and it does not go well. <laughs> they go up on the roof, they point the telescope up and none of them can see anything. Um, Galileo apparently is very disheartened, retreats to his room, spends the night alone and then leaves. And Horky writes a letter to Kepler recounting all of this and says, on earth it works miracles, but in the heavens it deceives. Galileo is not, has not seen the things he claims. Horky also, this is a Latin letter he writes to Kepler, includes at the very bottom of the letter a postscript in German, presumably so that any Italians who are looking through the post won't be able to understand it. And in the postscript he wrote that even though he thinks the telescope is somewhat of a fraud, in the dead of night he snuck over while Galileo was sleeping to the telescope and took an impression of Galileo's lens in wax so that he might be able to make a better telescope himself after Galileo leaves. But he leaves it at this, on earth it works miracles, but in the heavens it deceives. Now, it turns out that Kepler himself, unlike Horky, is predisposed to trust Galileo. And in fact, this incident, this, you know, these new stars of 1610 aren't the first time that Galileo has um, come onto his radar. So 13 years earlier, Kepler um, had published a book as a young 26-year-old, I'll show you that next, called The Mysterium Cosmographicum, The Secret of the Universe. Uh, we actually um, recently acquired in our own special collections at the Calvin Smith Library a beautiful copy of this very book. So in this book, um, Kepler uh, defended the new Copernican theory that argued that the sun and not the earth is at the center of the cosmos. Copernicus had actually published his theories about 50 years earlier. Here I can show you, um, right, Copernicus is famous 1543 on the revolutions of the heavenly spheres and the one, the diagram from his book showing uh, the sun at the center of the system and not the earth. But even though it's been 50 years since this book has been published, it's still a fairly unpopular position. There are very, very few people in Europe who take this seriously. Most astronomers either um, discount it in favor of one of the other two cosmological options, which are the traditional Ptolemaic geocentric system or the Taconic geoheliocentric system, or they adopt the theories of Copernicus as instrumental mathematical tools. Tools. They'll use them for calculations, but they don't believe that this is actually the way things are. Kepler does. He believes it, he thinks it's really important, and he wants other people to believe it too. He writes his first book as a defense of the Copernican system. Um, he actually uses what you're seeing here are um, the platonic solids as a way to show what the order of the planets would be and how far apart they are from each other in the Copernican system and thinks that in so doing, he's given a really good proof for the Copernican system, right? If it all works with the orders and the platonic solids, uh, it must be that this is the way things are. So he publishes this book and wants to send it out to the world, even though people haven't heard of him yet, so he can show them that Copernicus is right. So the first thing he does 
is sends it to the annual Frankfurt Book Fair, which is the most important book fair in Europe, so that people can find it there and have access to it and read it. But he also sends copies with friends heading in all different directions so they can distribute it to people they know who might be interested. Um, it's, he probably has not yet heard of Galileo, who's not yet famous, still 1596, 1597, but he sends two copies to Italy, and one of them happens to make its way into Galileo's hands. Um, Galileo reads the book, is really delighted with it, and immediately writes a letter to Kepler saying, I loved your book, I'm a Copernican too. Right, so here I give you um, just some copies of the letters between Kepler and Galileo from then. He says, I'm a Copernican too. In fact, I have many proofs and demonstrations that Copernicus is right and not Ptolemy. Turns out some of those are right and some of those are wrong, but that's another story. He says, I can prove that Copernicus is right, but I don't really talk about this publicly because Copernicus is still so ridiculed today. The idea that the sun is at the center of the system is still so much in doubt that I, don't, I feel like it's better to be silent about this. Kepler writes back to him immediately and says, I'm so glad um, to have found another Copernican. He calls him an ally in the search for truth. Um, and he urges him to be vocal and public about uh, his support of the Copernican theory. He says, there's no way that this theory will spread unless more of us come out and speak vocally about it. Tell people what you think, show them what you think. We can write together and convince the world. Unfortunately, Galileo doesn't write back. This is the last that Kepler hears from him for 13 years. So 13 years later, Kepler is no longer um, a school teacher in Graz, which he was at the time, 1597, 1596. Now he's imperial mathematician of the Holy Roman Emperor. Galileo has the telescope. He's pointed it up at the sky. He's seen these four new objects. He's seen a lot of other things too. And he decides to publish a book explaining to people what he's seen, right? Because he knows that word is out there. So he writes a book called The Starry Messenger. I give you the title page here. Um, he uh, identifies himself in the book as a Galileo Galilei, a gentleman of Florence. I'm also a professor at the University of Padua, a math mathematics professor. Um, he mentions the four new planets very prominently on the title page and calls them the Medici and stars. So he names them after his patrons, the Medici. Um, and in the book, he shows what he's seen with so, for instance, um, the, these images of the surface of the moon, uh, people had traditionally believed that the surface of the moon was perfect and smooth, um, and he shows that it's not, it's rough, it has mountains and craters. Um, he points the telescope at the stars and finds that there are many more stars out there than were visible with the naked eye. So here's one of his images of the Pleiades. Um, and then shows the images of the objects he's seen going around Jupiter and argues that they're moons. Um, and shows how he has come to that determination. So he writes this book, uh, but he knows that people are going to be doubtful. So um, he remembers Kepler, who was written to him years earlier, who's also a Copernican, and he sends a message to the Tuscan ambassador um, at the imperial court asking for Kepler to read and support the book. Um, Kepler uh, gets the message, reads the book, um, immediately uh, supports it and comes and writes a letter to Galileo saying, I love the book, it's great, everything you're saying in it is true, um, and then publishes that letter, I'll show you the title page here, um, so that everybody can see it right away. Instead of drafting a formal treatise, he just publishes his open letter to Galileo. He calls it a conversation with the starry messenger of Galileo. Um, and in it, he includes all of his defenses of the book. So the first thing I want to say is that um, Kepler was very supportive of Galileo, even without having a telescope, right? He, he couldn't verify what Galileo had seen. He didn't have access to, to Galileo's telescope, um, but um, he himself had written about optics before. He was very interested in optical theory, so he had reason to trust the telescope because he understood how it might work. Um, he also couldn't have failed to notice that this book, The Starry Messenger, was the first place where Galileo had ever publicly declared his support for, Copern for Copernican theory. And he did it in a very offhand way uh, when he mentioned that uh, these moons are uh, going around Jupiter, which itself is going around the center of the universe, which is the sun. Right? It was an offhand reference, but for Kepler this is important. And the discovery of the moons of Jupiter removed a common objection to Copernican theory in general, which is, well, if you're debating what everything goes around, what's the center of the system? Is it the Earth or is it the Sun? 
we know the moon goes around the earth, right? So why would one thing go around the earth and everything else go around the sun, right? It seems strange. But if we see that there are things going around objects other than the earth, right? If the other objects have moons, then it's not crazy to say, well, everything also goes around the sun, right? For to Kepler that cleared up that objection. So he came out um, and publicly supported the book with his conversation and hoped that in so doing, uh, it would, um, it would help with the doubts of Horky and other people. They would read the book and they would understand that they should trust Galileo. All right, now this is where our story gets a little strange <laughs> because everybody reads Kepler's book and this is not the lesson they take away from it. They read the book and they decide that what Kepler has done is not support Galileo, but rather criticize and condemn him. Um, in fact, after reading Kepler's book, Horky writes a book of his own give you the title page here. It's called A Brief Foray Against the Starry Messenger. In this book, he says that it's a fraud, the telescope is a fraud, those planets, those moons don't exist. He quotes Kepler, Kepler's conversation, as support. And he's so confident that Kepler will agree with what he's saying that he sends Kepler a copy of the book and says, I totally took down Galileo. Thank you so much for your confirmation. Here's my book, you're gonna love it, <laughs> right? Now, Horky may simply have been a bad reader, but he wasn't the only one to read Kepler's book in this way. I'll just give you a couple of other examples. Um, Kepler's old astronomy professor, Michael Meslin, who himself is a Copernican, he's one of the rare few at the time, writes to Kepler saying, good job with your uh, conversation again with the starry messenger. You have deplumed Galileo. You totally took him down, alluding to the story of Aesop um, and the jackdaw who dresses himself in the borrowed feathers of other birds. Um, the imperial ambassador to Venice, Georg Fugger, also writes the same thing to Kepler. Um, Galileo, he says, is accustomed to collecting the feathers of others in order to decorate himself as Aesop's crow, and you have totally shown that. Great work. So the first question is, what went wrong, right? Why was Kepler's book so misunderstood? And this has to do with the, a problem Kepler had, which is, how am I supposed to support Galileo without a telescope, right? He's written this book. Everybody wants to know whether they should trust him. I don't have a telescope either. How can I convince them that what he's saying is trustworthy? So Kepler's answer is to rely on another source of authority, right? Traditionally, still in the 17th century and going way back, how do we trust that something is true? How do we know it's authoritative? If it agrees with uh, antiquity, if people have said it before, right? The problem with Galileo's ideas is that they're new and nobody has seen them and they're unexpected. And what Kepler does in the book is say, actually, they're not crazy and they're not new. In fact, even in the books of the ancients, there are anticipations of these very ideas. So Gal Kepler spends much of the book citing the agreement of authority and tradition, and in fact, quoting the many predecessors who have anticipated some of these very claims. He cites Pythagoras and Plutarch. He notes that Della Porta, um, in his book on natural magic, has anticipated the telescope itself, as has Kepler himself in his optics. He notes that some of these people have anticipated the idea that there are more stars in the sky that you can see, and some have even anticipated the rough surface of the moon. And he says, you can trust it because they said it too. This is not new, all right? So what went wrong? <laughs> what went wrong is first and foremost that Kepler seems to have unwittingly created the impression that Galileo was claiming credit for the ideas of other people, right? That um, Galileo hadn't cited his sources. And if Galileo couldn't be trusted to cite the people whose ideas had contributed to his own, then maybe, his readers thought, he couldn't be trusted when it came to the discoveries themselves. Maybe uh, the telescope itself was problematic. Maybe he hadn't seen the things he reported um, to have seen. Or you want to frame this in sort of broader historical terms. What went wrong is that science is in the middle of changing. And Kepler, is drawing on an older model of authority, which is tradition. How do we know that something is real and authoritative? We trust in the tradition. But there's a new kind of authority that's gaining popularity at this very moment, and it's the authority of novelty itself. It's the idea that um, I can trust something is true because it is new and unexpected and unprecedented, and nobody could have predicted this, right? We should recall that it's at this very moment 
that Francis Bacon is trying to reframe science, you know, argue for the inductive method and tell people that they shouldn't trust so blindly in the authority of antiquity, right? The trope traditionally is that um, antiquity, they're like the adults and we're the children and we look up to them. And Bacon says, no, antiquity is the childhood of the world. They came earlier, they're younger than us. We're the adults in the room and we're more authoritative. And when he argues uh, that the sciences have gotten it all wrong, he says, I look back on antiquity, they haven't done anything productive, right? Their, their works are barren and fruitless, he says. Uh, when he thinks about how to uh, build a new scientific method, he says, there was but one course left to try the whole thing anew upon a better plan and to commence a total reconstruction of science and all human knowledge raised upon the proper foundation, which is a modern foundation. The famous frontispiece to his uh, great installation in which he articulates this method shows the pillars of Hercules, which are the traditional boundaries of the ancient world beyond which nobody can go. And Bacon shows us the ship sailing through the pillars of Hercules to show us that we can go farther than anyone has gone before. So this is a new model um, and this model right? Not ancient knowledge, but new and unprecedented truths about nature. This turns Kepler's argument on, on its head, right? If Kepler's trying to, tr to say, trust it because it came before, more and more people are looking for things that didn't come before. Um, so at, on the one hand, right, this is not necessarily what they want. And on the other hand, um, he's showing them, look, there are all these people that said the same things Galileo said. Uh, he didn't mention them, right? So, um, so this is partially what happens. And this you can see in uh, the quote from Meslin. I'll give you the full quote here, the letter that Meslin writes to Kepler. You have deplumed Galileo by showing that he was not the first author of this new telescope, nor, to, nor the first to notice that the moon has a rough surface, nor the first in the world to show more stars in the heavens than we have up to now found listed in the writings of the ancients. Right? The idea is you've deplumed him by showing that everything he's written comes from other people, like the jackdaw's feathers. And what Meslin is suggesting is true, right? If Kepler has revealed Galileo to be a fraud when it comes to his sources, then shouldn't Kepler be happy that Horky has taken things to the next level and shown that uh, Galileo's discoveries themselves are fraudulent? So Kepler is not happy. <laughs> this is not what he intended. Um, and he struggles to undo the damage. The first thing he does is write to Galileo. And he says a few things. He disavows Horky says, Horky is an injudicious youth. He didn't read my book carefully. Uh, his book is not a faithful representation of my own. I, I disavow him entirely. He gives Galileo permission to publish that letter so that people know that uh, he doesn't stand behind Horky's use of his book. He also notes to Galileo that it's really hard to see the new objects around Jupiter. Um, the telescopes, he, he has access to some mediocre telescopes, but they're not showing him what he needs to see. Um, he notes that vision itself is deceptive, that sometimes some people can see some things that other people can't see. So he says, don't be surprised that people doubt these things. And he says further, we need more testimony from people who have actually seen these things, right? Um, what he's suggesting is that if ancient testimony is not going to sway people, if that's not going to be the thing in which authority rests, the say-so of one person is not going to be enough either. In other words, if we're discounting ancient tradition and testimony and we're relying on novelty, we need a way for that novelty to be accessible and witnessed and experienced by many people at the same time. Right, which um, shows us another trend that's happening um, at this moment in time in the 17th century, which is the transition from ancient testimony to what's known as witnessing. The idea that for something to be trustworthy, it has to be um, open and accessible to other people. And just to, to, to show you this shift, although these images are more complicated than I'm making them out to be, I give you first the frontispiece to Kepler's Rudolphine Tables, in which Kepler shows us the temple of astronomy, um, which is held up by the pillars of all the people who have come before him, right? So you can see maybe if you look, um, Tycho Brahe's pillar and Copernicus's pillar, Ptolemy has a pillar, the Babylonian astronomers have pillars. Um, and Kepler's idea here is that astronomy is held up by the collective effort of generations. 
the other image is the frontispiece to another book that was published the same year as Copernicus's book, 1543. And this is Andreas Vesalius's On the Fabric of the Human Body, which is a book that revolutionized the study of anatomy. So on the cover of this book, on the frontispiece of this book, Vesalius does show us certain ancient token figures. You can see the robed figures in the very front. But he also shows us a scene in a figure where one person is dissecting a body and everybody else is watching, right? Which is not traditionally how the study of anatomy would have been done. It would have been um, somebody dissecting with somebody else reading from a textbook and everybody listening to what Galen said and writing that down, right? And Vesalius is showing us that to be trustworthy, you need to witness things yourself, right? So this is the shift that Kepler is pointing to when he says, if my invocation of the ancients who agreed with Galileo was not gonna be enough, we need other ways to access the things that, um, that Galileo says he's seen. We can't just trust the word of Galileo. So he writes that letter to Galileo. Then he writes another letter to Horky. And here we have a story of mixed messages and cross paths. Kepler writes a letter to Horky and he says, Horky, you misread my book. I'm really mad at you. Um, I wrote to Galileo. I told him everything you did wrong. I told him he could publish my letter and your reputation is about to be trashed. And he in fact says to Horky, you should leave the country before this happens <laughs> because you're not gonna wanna be there for the fallout. So Horky does leave the country, but he leaves the country before Kepler's letter gets to him. It misses him. And he leaves the country and decides to visit Kepler so they can celebrate their takedown of Galileo together. And he shows up at Kepler's door without having received the, Ke the letter that Kepler sent to him expressing his displeasure. So there's a moment, if you can imagine it, where Kepler and Horky are at the door and Kepler doesn't know that Horky doesn't know that Kepler's mad and Horky doesn't know that Kepler doesn't know <laughs> that he doesn't know that he's mad. And there are sort of mutual recriminations and confusion until finally they realize that their letters have missed each other um, and Horky realizes just how mad Kepler is at him. And Horky, who really values Kepler's patronage and friendship, is very dismayed by this turn of events and tries to convince Kepler that he's done the right thing. He says, listen, I didn't just go out there and take down Galileo because I felt like it. A lot of the professors in Bologna don't trust this guy, and he refuses to debate with them. He hides in his house. He uh, uses the reputation of his patrons to protect him. He won't give anybody a telescope. He won't debate publicly with anybody. What was I supposed to do? Um, and Kepler eventually comes to realize that Horky is kind of right. right? Not, he's not right that Galileo was a fraud. Kepler continues to trust in the discoveries of Galileo. But Horky is right that maybe there's an excuse for the book he wrote. So Kepler writes to Galileo and says, don't publish the letter I wrote about Horky. It wasn't his fault. I, I, I get where he's coming from. And Kepler's about face here stems from a sort of general frustration he's starting to feel with Galileo, right? Uh, and there are a few reasons for this. Recall first that he's had no word from Galileo in 13 years, right? They had shared those two letters where Kepler said, I'm on your side, let's team up until, um, until Galileo needs him, right? Galileo needs him, sends him uh, this request for support, um, won't send Kepler a telescope to verify his discoveries, right? Kepler writes to him repeatedly. He has the Tuscan ambassador go back to Galileo and say, can you please send Kepler a telescope so he can support you publicly? And Galileo says, yeah, I'm sorry. I've already given them out to all my patrons and they're really hard to make and I just don't have any left. And he won't give him a telescope. He won't give him the plans for a Galilean telescope. Kepler eventually has to borrow one from the Elector of Cologne, a noble to whom Galileo has given a telescope once he passes through Prague, and Kepler will use that telescope to verify the discoveries. Um, but he's frustrated by Galileo's reluctance to share his knowledge. Um, Galileo is not only reluctant to share a telescope, he's reluctant to share the precise nature of his discoveries once he's made them. So to give you an example, when Galileo makes discoveries, he sends them to Kepler as anagrams. Right? Here's one that he sends to Kepler. He says, Kepler, in a letter, I made a fabulous discovery. I've encoded it here. So Kepler spends a lot of time trying to figure out what it is. Here's the guess he sends back. He sends back, be greeted, double knob, children of Mars. Maybe, maybe there are moons of Mars he's found, right? It's wrong. Uh, it turns out the answer is, uh, I have a highest of the planets, which is Saturn, three form, with 
refers to the rings of Saturn, which Galileo has discovered. Galileo also sends Kepler an anagram when he discovers the phases of Venus. Kepler sends back eight guesses, <laughs> none of which are right, um, until Galileo finally reveals the answer. So Kepler um, is a little frustrated by all of this, and though he continues to only speak positively about Galileo publicly and to support all of his ideas, um, he wishes that he would be a bit more open in sharing what he knows. Um, and so this, I think, ah, here, let me give you this, this fabulous quote um, from Kepler to Galileo. I implore you, do not keep the matter hidden from us any longer. See that you are dealing with real Germans. I come away impatient from your various literary secrets. Do you see the misery in which you cast me with your silence? Right, this before Galileo has revealed one of his anagrams. So I am perhaps uh, drawing the contrast between the two of them a bit strongly, but I want to suggest that um, these two men embody two different approaches to the enterprise of science in certain respects, right? Um, and so just to draw that out for you, right, Galileo um, is really interested in maximizing personal credit. He wants to get credit for the things that he's discovered. Um, because of that, he minimizes information that he gives out to his competitors. Kepler sees his ideas as contributions to public knowledge, believes in the open exchange of information. Galileo tends to direct his work to powerful patrons. In fact, before he publishes The Starry Messenger, most of his work is directed toward his immediate circle of Italian nobles and patrons. Um, and when he does publish The Starry Messenger, it's specifically because he wants priority in this discovery. Um, Kepler is interested in creating a unified community of scholars, and you can see this both in that original letter of 1597 where he says, come out, let's form a community of Copernicans and let's tell the world that we're all in this together, and when he cites all the people who contributed to Galileo's ideas in his conversation with the Starry Messenger, right? That's his attempt to draw Galileo back into the sort of larger historical community of science. Um, Galileo is concerned with priority and securing his status as an inventor and discoverer. Right? He's invested in this idea of novelty. Um, Kepler still relies on ancient authority as support, right? as we saw in the conversation with the Starry Messenger. He sees himself as part of a continuing tradition. So part of this story then, in this contrast with the two men, is about a change in the nature of scientific knowledge at this time. Right? The question that everybody's grappling with in the course of the scientific revolution or early modern science or 17th century science or whatever we want to call it is what is science and what makes it authoritative right what do i trust what do i trust as certain um, what do i trust as productive um, and there's a move over time logical deduction and ancient testimony to novelty and experience and experiment now i want to stress here that Kepler is not a reactionary by any means, right? He's one of the first Copernicans when there are only about 10 in all of Europe. He's working at the court rather than the university, which was traditionally seen as a more forward-looking institution that lets him experiment. He relies on empirical observation in order to formulate his theories, right? He's not just reading old books. But he still does see ancient tradition as having a certain kind of authority. Like Copernicus before him, he tries very hard to link his theories to those of Pythagoras and Aristarchus and holds them up as counterexamples to Ptolemy and Aristotle, right? Whereas um, Galileo says, these are the Medicean stars. They are special because nobody has or could have seen them before, and I claim credit for them and name them after my patrons. So Galileo's model is the one that's on the rise, right? The stress on novelty and personal experience and experiment. But what Kepler soon realized is that it couldn't rest on the say-so of any one individual, right? Galileo can't just say, I saw this and everybody has to believe him. If we're moving from a model of ancient testimony and old books to a model of experience and experiment and novelty, that model needs to be collaborative. There needs to be a way for everybody to experience and attest to these novel matters of fact, them, to participate in that in their construction. We need to have a community of scientists who can do this together. Um, and for that to be true, that community cannot even be a community of any one court or university or city or state or country, right? What people come to see is that this needs to cross borders and be international in scope. And I give you here 
um, the letter of Henry Oldenburg, the secretary of the Royal Society from 1670, um, who says that it is needful that the resources, labels, uh, my, sorry, my, my screen is blocking the quote, um, labors and zeals of all regions, princes, and philosophers be united so that this task of comprehending nature may be pressed forward by their care and industry, right? This has to be something that's happening across the board. Um, I give you as visual examples, right? Um, first, collections of novel objects that people start assembling, right? If we're gonna build certain sciences on things nobody has seen before, and artifacts nobody has seen before, and samples nobody has seen before, we need people to be able to access them themselves. Let's collect them together, let's assemble them in rooms, in books, in museums. And let's have public experiments, right? The one I show you here is, um, an experiment, an experiment on atmospheric pressure, right? Where what happens when you pump air out of these spheres? <coughs> Can they be pulled apart by a team of horses? No. Let's make these things accessible to everybody. <coughs> Sorry, I should have brought some water. Um, there's still a tension here when it comes to what this new scientific community should look like. Right? As we saw with Kepler and Galileo, there's a struggle when it comes to the building of a scientific community between the need for communal cooperation and openness and the desire for credit and priority, right? Um, both are gonna be true at the same time and both threads stay with us today. Also, if this new community is going to be international in scope, there are gonna be challenges it faces. Um, as we saw in the kepler horky interaction, right? Um, when we're trying to send information back and forth, there will be delays, there will be confusion about what the new news is. There will be cross paths with Kepler and Horky. There will be misconstrued tones when it comes to all the people who read Kepler's book. There will be things that help this. So there are gonna be faster and more efficient means of communication <coughs> and dissemination. The first postal service, um, comes into being in 1497 in the Holy Roman Empire. <coughs> My bad for not bringing some water. Um, printing presses are flourishing at exactly this time, spreading books faster and faster. Scientific journals, which are gonna be the arms of the new scientific societies, are starting to publish their results. So this happens in about 1665. All this will help get information around faster. But there remains a tension between the desire for openness and and the desire for intellectual property and credit that we saw between Kepler and Galloway. Kepler himself um, is not particularly worried about privilege and priority. I'll give you this quote from Kepler. Kepler receives a letter from a friend saying, I heard that Galileo was taking credit for some of your ideas. And let me just see here. What he says is this. I am not worried that Galileo claims my ideas. There are those who emphasize truth and the glory of God, the creator, rather than their own reputations. Let my name perish so long as the name of God is thus promoted. So luckily Kepler's name did not perish. <laughs> we remember him. Um, and while Galileo may have been the savvier self-marketer, um, I think it's worth remembering Kepler and the spirit of his pursuit of science as we think more about how we want to build the scientific communities of today. Thank you. I guess I'll unmute and clap too. Okay, so uh, for the question session, I guess um, people want to start adding stuff to the chat. Viva, I don't know if you want to run and get some water really quick. Uh, I think I, now that I've stopped here, talking, okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, we'll see. Okay. Let me open the chat on my screen too. <laughs> I guess while some people are thinking of some questions, I was wondering with the anagrams that you showed, was that typical for other people to do in their letters just to try to keep their idea secret or was that unique to Galileo? Um, I mean, people do, there, there were ciphers around, but no, I think this is, this is in terms of sharing this like scientific information, right? we're only, we're building a new kind of scientific community at this moment in time. So this mm -hmm. whole project is new. But um, but Galileo is noteworthy for this. He's unusual in his in his. Okay. <laughs> yeah, and it seemed like they weren't very easy. If like Kepler took eight guesses and so could no. Okay, um, so I think 
Corbin has a question if Corbin would like to ask. Can you unmute, unmute you? Here, let me unmute you. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah. Yep. Okay. Oh, yeah, that was a great talk. I really liked it. Um, let me um, ask a question. So there's a tension, there's another tension that you might want to reflect on that I think is quite interesting. And that is the tension between the, those things that can be observed um, by a human person, in some sense of the word, directly and unaided, versus those things that have to be observed um, using technology, technology which may on the cutting edge be challenging for a non-expert to, 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 to use effectively and practically. Um, and so there's this question of scientific verification by your peers, but there's also the question of how can you, how can you assess that, that, that verification when the technology sits between you and the interpretation of that verification. Um, the extreme, again, this is extreme, the extreme example of this is what I'm calling you know, some explanations for what we call the current flat earth movement, mm -hmm. right? Where people claim that if I can't, even though very straightforward technology can demonstrate that the earth is round, that the, seems like the emotional justification of flat earthers is if I can't see around earth, I don't need to believe it. I don't know what you want to reflect on that. Yeah, no, it's such a really good point. And one of the reasons that people are distrustful of the telescopic discoveries, even after they've been verified, right? So the Collegio Romano, the Jesuit astronomers in Rome, eventually verify Galileo's discoveries and send word out to everybody. They say, we can see these things, right? They're real. They're out there. They're his, you know, amongst earlier supporters, which is interesting given the aftermath of that story. But um, people say, well, maybe the telescope distorts things, right? How can we trust that the telescope is showing us things that are actually there rather than creating things, right? How can we trust this device? So one thing Kepler does immediately afterward is he publishes his dioptrix, right, which is his study of um, lenses. So he can help people understand how they work, which he thinks is an important part of the support of Galileo. Um, and the other thing he does is try to show how the eye works. And the argument he makes is that the eye is basically a lens just like the lens you would use in machines, right? So that if there are problems with the telescope, if the telescope is distorting things, it's not doing anything different than what your eye does too. <laughs> so, so that's one side of things, right? To show that, um, that you know, machines and, and unaided vision are not that different. The other side of things is that there is a whole, you know, a discourse going on around this time with Francis Bacon and others who specifically link technology to, the, to a kind of um, scientific effort to overcome what they see as human flaws uh, gained because of the fall of man, right? So the reason our eyes are so bad, they argue, once our eyes were perfect, um, and because of original sin, now they're not, but technology will help us regain paradise by making them the way they once were, is the argument that these men make. And they, they show this, they try to portray the scientific project as a project to regain what was lost. Okay, so for the next question, um, Phil, I think was the next notice I got. Okay, thank you very much. That's a, a beautiful talk. And one of the fascinating things was showing light of the personalities of these people and how that reflected. Um, my, my question is that a lot of people, the opinion they have of Galileo's personality comes from Bertolt Brecht. Mm -hmm. uh, is, <laughs> is that a trouble for you? And would you care to comment on that? Uh, I mean, I think that, that that's true and that's interesting. When I teach Galileo sometimes, I will um, have students either read the play or see the film version of the play and then read the original sources and comment on the discrepancy because, you know, Brecht's Galileo is a literary creation. Um, but um, Galileo, you know, when you read the documents, you do see that Galileo had uh, an aggressive and personality. <laughs> Some of the trouble he got himself into was because of how he interacted with other people. Um, so, so yeah, I think I, I, see, I see the Brecht portrayal of Galileo as an interesting way to get people into the conversation and see what, see the difference between a historical figure and the many ways that they're portrayed, they're portrayed over time. Thank you. And then Alan Rock, Alan Rock has a question. Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Um, very nice talk, lovely talk, Aviva. Thank you. Thank you. Um, 
you drew out many contrasts and some similarities between Galileo and Kepler. Uh, you haven't um, said much, and I'd like you to say a little, a little bit more uh, about something I know you're well equipped to, to talk uh, about, and that is nationalism and religion. Uh, you mm -hmm. have Galileo, the uh, Italian Catholic, and Kepler, the German Protestant, and that right. makes a difference. Yeah, it does. I mean, and I guess one thing that we should say at the start is the very fact that um, they're working together despite all these tensions shows the way that this nascent scientific community can overcome those boundaries, right? Um, that Galileo, the Italian, and Kepler, the, uh, you know, the Italian Catholic and Kep Kepler, the Protestant German, can work together, right? They, Kepler sees himself as engaged in the same project as Galileo, and Galileo would agree with that, right? right? I think, you know, um, like the Republic of Letters before it, the, uh, the burgeoning scientific community of the 17th century is trying to set itself up as above and beyond those boundaries. Um, but, you know, they, they do have an effect, right? The, um, the troubles that Galileo finds himself in eventually are linked specifically to his Italian Catholic context. Kepler is able to avoid similar troubles, although he, he has issues of his own, right? Because, uh, because he's in a cosmopolitan city, he is a Protestant working for a Catholic emperor in a city with lots of different, you know, religious affiliations. So it is easier for him um, to say certain things and get certain things done. And he will write to Galileo eventually, as will other people, and say, if it's difficult for you to publish in Italy, uh, come here, publish here. Um, Kepler is also very concerned um, to, to make sure that his own books are read in Italy. Once the, um, in 1616, once the, um, you know, the church uh, formally uh, bans Copernican books unless certain things are edited out, um, then um, Kepler worries that his own books will not be able to be read there and does his best to try to get them disseminated however possible. Um, so these boundaries are there, but, but our, you know, the, the major players in our story are, are struggling to stay above them. And I should say, not, uh, let, me, let me add, that that makes it sound as though those identities are just problems. For Kepler, they're not, right? Kepler sees himself as engaged in a religious project. He sees himself as an exegete of the book of nature. Um, he, he calls himself a priest of God when it comes to you know, interpreting the cosmos. So he sees what he's doing as a religious project too. Interesting. Any other questions? Any questions from students? I don't have anything else in the chat, but feel free to unmute yourself or ask us on YouTube if you have one. I see a question here in my chat window about why Kepler didn't try to visit Galileo to see for himself, uh, which is an interesting question. Um, I'm not sure how easy that would have been. I, I suppose he could have, although Galileo never extended that invitation. Um, and, you know, Kepler has responsibilities at the court. Um, so from his perspective, it's easier just to try to get a telephone. He does have um, weak ones, but, um, and he does eventually, I mean, it's not that long afterwards that he will borrow that one from the Elector of Cologne. So he writes the, I'm trying to think when he, he publishes a book called Narration, um, where he narrates what he sees through the telescope. And it's fairly soon after all of this happens. I see one other question. Should I read it on okay. the road? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Um, it says, uh, presumably they're communicating primarily in Latin, but are there, are there any language issues? So yes, Latin is the language of scholarship. It's the, it's the sort of global language that unites people so that everybody can talk to each other. Um, uh, Kepler will also write in German to people, and Galileo will also write in Italian to other people, but when they write to each other, they're writing in they're writing in Latin. Horky and Kepler will write, will switch back and forth between German and Latin. Um, and often in the same letter, you'll see people switching back and forth depending on who they're writing to. It will also depend on the subject matter. So, um, you know, in letters, it depends who you're talking to, but in books, um, you might publish, um, you know, sort of higher, more scholarly subjects in Latin and subjects like, you know, political tracts or astrological treatises, you might publish those in the vernacular. Galileo is particularly noteworthy um, once we get a little, after the story messenger he publishes in Latin and he sends it out to the world and he wants everybody to know I did this. But once we get to 1632, he publishes his famous dialogue on the two world systems in Italian. 
And that's a deliberate cue and a change of audience and a move, you know, it, for, on his part, a move to, to rope in um, more people besides the immediate scholarly elite too. So science is changing when it comes to its languages at this moment also. Uh, can I uh, see, can I, should I read the next question? Can yeah, you, I think people are sending them directly to you, so. Some people are, yeah. Can you elaborate briefly on some of the responsibilities of a court mathematician? Um, so uh, it's a good question. Um, Kepler's responsibilities were um, often astrological and political, right? So um, mathematician slash astronomer, astronomy and astrology are still linked at this moment in time, although there is a debate about um, what astrology is and how it works that Kepler is deeply involved in. But he is supposed to look at the stars um, and make, you know, astro draw astrological lessons from them and use those lessons to give political advice to the emperor which he does frequently, um, although in interesting ways. Um, he also, um, this is the moment in time when um, the calendar is in the process of being reformed, right? Pope Gregory has um, switched over, you know, um, convened a panel of people to reform the Julian calendar. Um, he's offered up one model that it's contentious whether um, people will accept it or not. So Kepler is also involved in writing up proposals about whether the emperor should accept the calendar in his realm, anything in which, um, uh, any any ways in which mathematical issues might have political import. It's his role to to talk about them. I see other. I see a bunch of other questions too. Let's see. Um, I'm interested in the ways they transition from ancients as authority to observation. Oh, that's a big question. <laughs> I'm not sure I can I can fully answer that question uh, um, at this moment, except to say um, that it's not an either or, right? Which I hope you saw from my um, from my lecture. Kepler is invested deeply in both. Um, at a certain point in time, you get invocations of the ancients more as sort of rhetorical window dressing, like, "Look, Pythagoras said it too, but I'm going to show you what I see." Right? Um, Kepler is maybe you know a, a transitional figure in the sense in which I think he really does believe that um, Copernicus is resurrecting a, a certain kind of ancient story that was true but forgotten, and he is interpreting what Copernicus said, and all of them are interpreting the you know the true picture of God's cosmos or something like that. But like I said, he's also you know um, very empirical. The whole reason he rejects circular orbits instead you know in favor of elliptical orbits is because the data just doesn't fit. Um, and that is a much, you know, arguably a bigger change than switching what the center of the cosmos is, right? Breaking the circle and switching to ellipses. So, he, so he's a highly observational um, figure too. Galileo will occasionally in figures, but for him, it's really more window dressing. And at a certain moment in time, um, you don't want to invoke the ancients. You, you really want to say that what you're doing is new. And that's hope happening over the course of the 17th century. Um, should I read some more? How much time do we have? I have more questions coming in. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Okay, let's see. Um, uh, were there tensions? I have two questions about tensions between religious beliefs and scientific work. Um, and that's also a really big question, right? So, I mean, you could, I, I could, I, you can teach a whole course <laughs> on this question. Uh, Kepler did not believe that there was such a tension, right? So he believed that, um, um, you know, what, what he, the way he said it is, uh, the book of nature and the book of scripture cannot conflict with one another, right? Um, um, and that um, what he was doing was itself a religious task. But some of the conclusions he drew um, caused him to um, depart from certain, you know, um, Lutheran orthodoxy in ways that eventually got him excommunicated. <laughs> so, um, right, and then, you know, we know, too, the story of Galileo. I mean, maybe we, that story itself, I think, has been, you know, told in different ways over the years. Uh, Galileo is not just about religious conflict. It's important. Um, this work that Galileo is doing to argue for a new kind of cosmology and integrate it with scripture is happening after the Reformation and the Counter-Reformation, when it's a particularly weighted moment in time to try to reinterpret the Bible, right? So 
there are there are tensions, but those tensions are of a particular moment in time where religion itself is undergoing dramatic changes and people are struggling with how to deal with that and then coming in and saying, well, actually, you can reinterpret what you thought the Bible said is newly uh, is a newly laden and weighted thing to say. So the quick answer is, um, for these a lot of these, most of these people were deeply religious figures, um, but yes, tensions will arise. I see a couple, I see another question. One more. Here. I, see, I see some hands and questions. I don't know the order you want to do this in. I guess pick one that seems most interesting or a wild card. <laughs> um, so here's a question. I have read that Copernicus borrowed his ideas from um, the 13th century Persian Nasir al-Din al-Tusi. Um, so that, that's, um, it depends what you mean by borrowed his ideas. Copernicus, we think now, relied on um, the Tusi couple, right? This, uh, you know, a mathematical device that um, al-Tusi developed in order to translate between linear and circular motion, right? We think that because the diagrams that Copernicus uses to illustrate this are really, really similar to the diagrams in, you know, that Altusi uses, right? Even with the, you know, the letters being the same, the specific letters he uses. So the thought, and this is this is all pretty new. The thought is that Copernicus somehow. Um, uh, read a manuscript that did have this information in it and then used, without this mathematical device, he might not have been able to come up with his theories. Um, but his theories are not just this, right? So his theories use this in order to argue um, for a much bigger change, right? For, you know, um, for ways in which you might switch um, what Ptolemy does um, with his, um, you know, uh, equants and his, the, the ways in which Ptolemy translates uh, the motions of the planets into the Copernican system. But yes, he did rely on this um, on this work. Cool, and to finish up, I guess on time, if you wanna pick like one more and then we can wrap up. Uh, did I miss any? Let me see. You, if you got all. I, I think I got all the ones in my list, although I see, okay. I see like hands showing in front of some of the people on the Zoom. I don't know what that means. Should I unmute somebody? <laughs> Let's see. Or can you do that, Lydia? Yeah, I'm trying to. I just see Chuck's hand if he still has a question. Oh, he, he, wrote, he wrote it. Oh, okay. maybe, maybe that was the question. Was that the question I got already? Yeah. Yeah, about Kepler okay. not trying to visit. Okay, great. Great. So with that, let's thank Aviva again. You can unmute yourself and clap or use the reactions and stuff. But great start for our colloquia series. So thank you so much. Thank you. Good to see everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.